Hello and welcome to this Journal Club presentation for 8846 NRS. My name is Josh Cooley and it's my pleasure to share with you what I believe is an exciting and impactful study that I hope will influence your practice as it's influenced mine. So I'd just like to firstly acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we're now on. I'd like to also pay our respects to the elders past and present and emerging. So for today's discussion, I'd like to introduce the article, the authors and the journal that the study was published in. And I'll then discuss what the study aimed to answer, its importance and how they tried to answer those questions. Uh, I'll summarize the results and I'll critique the study and I'll identify any limitations that could improve future research if they were addressed. Uh, lastly, I'll share how I believe that this study has informed changes in my personal practice, but also potentially for the journal club. So I can appreciate that all of us in this class come from diverse backgrounds and likely different degrees. And I'm currently close to completing my master's of public health. And I've also been a registered nurse for the last eight years, working all over the country, but particularly in rural and remote communities as a primary health care nurse. Uh, in my current role, I have the great privilege of working with young veterans as a case manager with the Department of Veterans Affairs, and I help them navigate all their health and well-being challenges. And I take great pride in this work as a retired nursing officer with the Australian Army myself. So here's, a, I believe, a really powerful quote from Nelson Mandela here, and uh, I believe it captures our responsibility as healthcare professionals to care for those who most need it. So have a quick second to read, pause, and then we'll move on. So onwards to the article. The study is titled Methicillin Resistant Staphylococcus aureus Skin and Soft Tissue uh, Infections in Young People in Custody in New South Wales. So for the presentation, I'll speak out the acronym MRSA as MRSA for convenience, um, and that's methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. I'll also just use skin infections to simply describe both skin and soft tissue infections. So for the study, there are six authors, as we can see here, and they have published research across a variety of fields, including Indigenous Australian youth, uh, incarcerated youth, child behaviour and communication, pain management in prisoners and rural domestic violence. The authors belong to either the New South Wales Adolescent uh, and Forensic Mental Health Network or the Macquarie University's Health Studies Unit. The article was published in the Journal of Pediatrics and Child Health, also known as JPCH. Uh, and the journal is an extension of the Royal Australasian College of Physicians. And it's been in operation since 1965 with uh, 659 articles, uh, citable articles published as of 2020. Now, it should be noted that most of the journal's articles remain uncited. Uh, and this is consistent with its relatively low impact factor of 1.572, ranking it at 64 of the 121 paediatric journals out there. So what was the overall aim of the study? Well, the authors knew that MRSA skin infections cause severe issues for incarcerated populations and youths internationally, but there'd been no Australian studies exploring this. Uh, in response, they set out to measure the incidence of MRSA skin infections in incarcerated youth and identify any associated risk factors. So how did they do this? Well, they spent two years interviewing and assessing incarcerated youth uh, aged between 12 and 20 years old in New South Wales juvenile custodial centres. And so to further elaborate on why the study is important, we need to discuss what makes MRSA skin infections an ongoing serious public health issue. So as a quick primer, uh, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus is a type of bacteria that can be found in approximately one in every three people globally. And for many, the bacteria are just a part of the skin's natural flora and don't cause any issues. However, once it does enter a break in the skin, such as a surgical wound or a cut, the consequences can be severe and they can be persistent. So the bacteria quickly spreads skin to skin contact or from shared amenities like showers, locker rooms or fabrics like hospital beds or towns. And once the wound is infected, there can be a local inflammatory response with swelling and a collection of fluids or a deeper bone or joint infection. Uh, worse still, the bacteria can spread to the circulatory system, causing septicemia, pneumonia and carditis. 
So once MERS has spread to the blood, the fatality rate is nearly one in three patients, particularly patients aged 85 years and older. But that's not so important for this population. Even still, without septicemia, the infection can be debilitating. Those infected often deal with pain, mobility issues, and social stigma from visible boils and carbuncles, and others fearing that being infected or the perception of those who are infected as having poor hygiene. So MRSA was first identified in 1961, and it was predominantly considered a hospital-acquired infection. However, community-acquired MRSA skin infections have become far more prevalent and exceedingly difficult to eradicate. And so with community-acquired MRSA infections, they flourish in populations with limited access to cleaning facilities, um, those that have communal spaces, and particularly overcrowding. So it's no surprise that the most vulnerable people are those from lower socioeconomic groups, um, prisoners, the elderly, and rural and remote communities. Uh, trying to eradicate community-acquired MRSA is complex, and antibiotics and topical treatments do little to prevent the recurring infections. And so management needs to address the social determinants of health, like education, access to cleaning facilities, uh, family and community-wide treatment, and you know, particularly addressing things like overcrowding. So eradication is a momentous task, but successful strategies have emerged like family-wide treatment with nasal mupirocin, and interestingly, the use of community swimming pools that actually lead to low infection rates. Um, in terms of relevance for me, as a primary healthcare nurse in the NT, I often helped young Indigenous children and their families manage these persistent community-acquired skin infections. Uh, furthermore, in my current role as a case manager, I often see young veterans with health literacy or poor health literacy suffer from skin infections that, despite their best efforts, continue to cause them pain and impairment. I really believe that incarcerated youth are often powerless to change their circumstances while in prison. And so I believe this study helps shed light on this challenging infection. And as we'll soon discuss, it demonstrates how we as clinicians and decision makers can better protect this vulnerable population. So how did the researchers go about answering their research questions? Well, they designed a two year prospective study that started in February 2013 and ended in January 2015. Uh, the study did not have any randomization of participants, but instead observed all eight juvenile justice centres in New South Wales. A participant was included as part of the admission to the centre, or if they later presented to the health centres uh, with a skin and soft tissue infection. Ethics approval was obtained from three different entities, the Justice, Health and Human Research and Ethics Committee, the Juvenile Research Committee, and the Corrective Services New South Wales Ethics Committee. Interestingly, the study does not discuss getting consent from the participants. So I investigated this and the Australian Medical Association states that doctors and researchers in youth custody centres only need to seek out ethics approval and adhere to the research protocols set out by the NHMRC. So authors Manti and Lakari aptly state that consent from prisoners, um, it's, it's often questionable given the inherent power dynamic between researcher and prisoner and while I do feel uncomfortable that consent wasn't discussed in the paper, I'm somewhat reassured that three separate ethics committees approved the study. Uh, at admission, there were, uh, at admission and 10 days, uh, participants were assessed for SSTIs by trained nurses and asked about recent IV drug use and antibiotic use. Any identified infections were classified as either having a collection, like boils and abscesses, or no collection, like cellulitis or surgical wounds. The location, the size, and the type of wound were also recorded. Each infection had a swab sample sent to a local laboratory that used standardised protocols, and medical records were used to determine age, gender, Indigenous status, recent hospital admissions, criminal history, and number of times incarcerated, just to see those associations. Uh, every young person with an infection was followed up at two weeks, even if they had discharged from custody, which is great. And lastly, multivariate logistic regression analysis was used to determine those associations between the risk factors and whether they were a MRSA or non-MRSA soft tissue skin infection. Let's take a quick break, pause, shake it out, stand up, move around, press play, and let's keep going. Welcome back.
All right, so let's talk about what the researchers discovered by the end of the study. So in terms of numbers over that two year period, there were 6,791 custodial admissions with approximately 368 young people in custody each day in the state. The average age was 16 years old with 91% being male and 51% being indigenous. So sadly, we can already see here that the young indigenous males disproportionately make up the study population. And this is reflected in the adult population with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander men making up 27% of all prisoners, despite only being 2% of the national population. So in terms of skin infections, there were 77 cases of which nearly half were MRSA with an incidence of 11 uh, SSTIs per 1,000 custodial admissions and 4.7 MRSA infections per 1,000. At the two-week follow-up, all of the infections had resolved despite MRSA status or treatment, and none of the infections led to systemic illness or high-grade fevers. However, the close observation and management of these infections likely influenced their natural progression, preventing severe outcomes. So it's one potential um, limitation there. Now, in terms of risk factors, Indigenous young people were nearly six times more likely to have a MRSA skin infection. And if the infection presented with a collection, as seen in boils, it was 18 times more likely to be MRSA. But that is consistent with the hallmark feature of MRSA skin infections, which is collections. Lastly, recent antibiotic use was almost four times more likely to be associated with a MRSA skin infection. Uh, with the likelihood that those antibiotics were prescribed to treat the skin infection makes sense, but that they weren't actually appropriate or effective against those infections. Interestingly, there was no significant association between sex, age, location of infection, criminal history, IV drug use, or weight. So for the appraisal, I asked, was there a need for the study? Were the results valid? And what were the limitations? Now, we can already agree on the importance of the study in exploring the incidence and impact of this infection in a vulnerable population, given we didn't really know as much as we'd like at the onset. And when it comes to validity, it's clear that the researchers successfully measured the variables they intended to measure, and that the assessment and measurement and sampling of the skin infections were consistent and standardized, which is great. So let's talk more about limitations. So, the study could have been improved. Firstly, the authors did not verify any antibiotic usage with the participants. They relied on the participants memory, introducing recall bias and measurement bias for that variable antibiotic use. They might resolve this by following up with prescribing physicians, but this would have been really time consuming and may not have provided much more to the study. Secondly, after the initial and 10 day assessment, any young people in custody may have been able to hide their skin infections or avoid going to the health center. So the ability to avoid participation may have introduced selection bias, meaning the results may actually be undervalued. And lastly, while the skin infections occurred after admission, there were almost certainly more risk factors associated with pre and then post admission that weren't captured. Um, an example of the pre-admission living, pre-admission risk factors could have been living conditions, the number of people living with the youth before admission, or hygiene and health literacy. And an, an example of unrecorded confounders during admission could have been time spent in communal areas, the usage of shared surfaces such as gyms, or the regularity of cleaning, clothing and bedding. But with all of that said and done, the study was forthcoming with its limitations, some of which we've mentioned and they made great efforts to share the study's methodology and results. So in terms of applicability, what are the practical implications? Well, custodial centers are likely to benefit from education for healthcare providers and young people, like the signs and symptoms of MRSA skin infections and how hygiene and effective cleaning can prevent further spread. Um, for prescribers, greater awareness of antibiotic stewardship. So according to the Australian Commission on Safety and Health Quality Healthcare, the unnecessary use of antibiotics continues to worsen that resistance and makes these treating these infections even harder. And lastly, for us, we can look at the social determinants like uh, their, their housing, the infrastructure, access to cleaning. And so for us, we can be advocates for changing these determinants and advocating for that vulnerable population 
particularly young Indigenous Australian males who are disproportionately incarcerated and disproportionately suffer from these infections. So lastly, I personally believe this study has improved my practice by increasing my awareness of the impact of MRSA skin infections in this vulnerable population. And it's consolidated my knowledge and beliefs that the most vulnerable Australians often have little to no control over their environment. So it's my responsibility as a healthcare provider to help improve these conditions and raise awareness where possible so that long lasting change can occur. So to close, I'd like to thank you for listening to this presentation. It's been my pleasure. Um, certainly more questions to be asked and ideas for future research, but I commend the authors for this informative study and I look forward to more developments in this space. So again, thank you for your time and please don't hesitate to share your feedback.